So far in our Together series in the book of Ephesians, we've discussed God's people. Who are they? How are they described in Scripture? We started with God's people being a chosen people. We then talked about how they are a praying people, a changed people. Last week we talked about how they are a redeemed people. All these things and more are the ingredients of what a Christian is. That's you. Everything I just described is you. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, that's you. These ingredients make up who you are. You've been redeemed. You've been changed. You've been chosen for a purpose. You are part of God's plan. Okay? That's what I'm talking about this morning. Look at verse, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. It says, now therefore, kind of like now, what do you do now? Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That change in salvation, when salvation puts you in a new household, God's household, made you a fellow, fellow citizen among other citizens in God's kingdom. Remember who you are if you're saved and where you belong if you're saved. I want to make an easy point today. It's where we started with our children. And it's this. God's plan for you is, well, it's not going to manifest itself in isolation. You're not a solo piece. You're right. You're not a solo project for God. Sometimes people think, well, I got saved and so now God just kind of build me and I'm going to be this wonderful, wonderful project of God. I want you to understand that now you are a part of God's project. Look at verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We'll comment on these in a second. Look at 21. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. I'm going to get at some important piece of, of our psyches today and of God's plan for us today. The plan, is not, it, the plan is not that you are a solo project. Your plan, God's plan for your life, is to be part of a building, part of a project. It's going to be found, in other words, you're going to find your purpose in serving God among other believers. Think about it like this. I covered this with the kids, maybe the adults, but it'll ring true for us as well. How valuable, this is a Duplo, by the way, I'm educated. It's a Duplo, not a Lego, Duplo. How valuable is this Duplo on its own? Right? If, I, if I gave it to your child for their birthday, how excited would they be about one Duplo? What can you do with one Duplo? Hardly anything. But if you put duplos together, right, like I showed the kids, you can build something. Be part of the plan. Be part of God's building. There are many people, many Christians, who are living lives as a solo duplo. And they think God's going to use them for amazing things because they are an amazing duplo. You are nothing without being a part of God's plan. You find your plan by connecting with God's people. And being a part of his project and his building, we need real Christians in this world, in this nation, in this community to connect, yes. to be together, to serve together. So you can take all these things out, all these duplos, and throw them across the room. That's how Christians are living today. In isolation, God meant for people, it says about three times here, together, together, fitly joined, together. I, you show me somebody who has not found their household of Christians, who has not found their place in Christian works, I will show you somebody who is wasting their entire life. Where do you fit in God's project? We're big on our own projects, aren't we? We love having our own things that we build with our hands. Do you realize that if you've asked Christ to save your soul, you are his building block? He's given all the ingredients to make you the right kind of brick. But you need to find where you fit in God's work. Amen. Look at our text here. 
In verse, let's look at verse 20 to understand some of these things. It says in 20, it says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Everything we are today is built upon the, tr the foundational truths brought forward in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they all point to Jesus Christ, and He is that chief cornerstone upon which our life is built as Christians. Are you where God wants you to be in your life? Or are you living this life as a duplo in isolation? It says in verse 21, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. You see, God does things when he connects believers together. We see this, right? God puts a believer here, another believer here, another believer here. Pretty soon he's got a building, right? Pretty soon he's got something that's very visible for the world to see. For Lewiston to see, for them then to see that testimony, there's a group of people who are preaching Christ and Christ only. Right? There's a group of people who still think the Bible is true and wrongs are wrong and rights are rights. And you build it together, this loud voice for God in this world. It says, Groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. This project God's working on is built by God and it's for God and it speaks for God. Just let me finalizes that thought again. One Duplo is of zero value. You put bricks together though, Duplos together, and then there's something God can use and does use. So I ask you this morning, I ask you this morning, we've got some, hey Emma, my children over here I think are distracting um, this gentleman. Where do you fit? Where do you fit in God's building? Have you ever thought about this? To fit, you need to understand where you connect directly, right? You say, well, I, I'm in the body of Christ. I'm saved, so I, I fit right there by Moses. Well, Moses is dead. Well, I fit right there by St. Peter. That's, I'm fit. No, you don't. He's gone. Where do you connect today in the body of Christ? That means you've got to have living saints here today. Where are you connecting in this body of Christ? Where do you fit in God's work and God's plan? Or are you off doing your own thing? You think that you're quite valuable on your own. I'm this little light shining over here in my little pocket of the world. No, you're a dim little light. You're doing nothing for God's glory. If you do anything, it looks like it's bringing glory to yourself. Or some Christians have this mistaken idea that they fit with other groups. And we take ourselves and we try to fit in with the world. I'm in with this crowd, I'm in with this crowd. And you try to do this, this miracle which is connecting light with darkness and it's not possible. Scientifically not possible. Biblically not possible to connect with the world. You're supposed to connect with believers. Fellowship with the believers. Are you fighting against being a part of God's building? Are you fighting against your place in God's building? You know, sometimes people come to God's work and they're like, well, okay, I know I need to get involved with church, but I'm kind of a special Duplo. I need the spot right on top. You guys recognize the skills, right? I'm the gifted Duplo who automatically, whoop, put me on top somewhere, coach, put me in. I'm your star player. To understand this and dig deeper, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I thank you for coming out today. I really think God's got the right text for this uh, morning. It's amazing how God leads us to the text at the right time. 1 Corinthians 3. You know, the, the fact that matters this man behind the pulpit, I love you. And I want, uh, I want you to serve God in your life. But I don't really matter. You've got a God, right, who if he paid for you with his blood, he wants you serving him. We'll see some of what God expects from our lives in this passage, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. Let's start at 9. Describes these blood-bought Christians in really detailed terms. You say, well, I'm, I'm saved. I'm set free. I'm free to live how I want. Think again. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9. It says, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. A lot of people in this world are really good workers when it comes to working for themselves, but really lazy when it comes to working for God. But you are, as a Christian, if you call yourself, who calls himself a Christian? A lot of hands out there. Then you are God's laborer. You know what that means? A worker. 
labor. And the simple definition from 1828 says, one who labors in a toilsome occupation, one that requires little skill. Not only are we laborers for God, we're kind of the one who does the grunt work. We're not the brains of the operation. God's the brains of the operation, right? So we come just simply with our hands ready. Hey, where do you need me? Put me in, I'll do the work, right? I don't have all the ideas, I don't have all the answers, I don't have all the training, I'm here. I'm just willing to serve like a good labor would be, right? Big part of work is what? My dad taught me this. I like my dad. He's got some simple, simple sayings. One of them was always, you know, a big part of work, like I'd work with him sometimes in the hardwood business. The big part of work is just showing up. So we get there on Monday, we showed up. We got the first step, and now let's start working, right? We show up the next day, we just show up. A big part of laboring is being present, being there. No projects were ever done in your absence. Well, unless you make somebody else do it. That's a nice way to live, isn't it? You win a lot of friends that way. No, we show up and we work. The key is showing up, be there, be ready, work hard, volunteer. We know this in the world, don't we? You see this in the workplace. It's like, wow, that guy's really going places because he shows up, he's ready to volunteer for anything, he's ready to do the, the job that no one else wants to do. The world will take that person and he'll start getting a promotion after promotion after promotion. He will. It just happens. People like good help, right? I've even noticed the world, even a Christian, the world might not like Christians, but if a Christian's hardworking, they'll like that, right? They'll like good help. Everybody does. Helps their bottom line. Well, God likes good help, too. He likes people to say, I'm ready to serve. I don't know where to serve, but I'm ready to jump in. I, I've got two able hands. I can do something. God will give you something. And he'll see you be faithful there, and he'll give you something else. Show up and be a laborer. I think some people are waiting to serve God, waiting until God recognizes their credentials. You know, I have a PhD in laboring, so don't give me anything simple. Give me the brains of this operation. Look at that word husbandry. Husbandry. It means farmer. Farmer. I know farmers work hard. I know. I've known some, some, known some farmers. Uh, work hard tilling the ground, right? Or keeping track of whatever livestock they might have on that farm. Work hard. There are so many hardworking farmers in this world. They rise early. They work long, long hours. Faithful to that work. Boy, it's great. But I'll tell you what. We need all believers, including believing farmers, to work that hard for the things of the Lord. We, it's more important. You understand that a farmer's harvest, we talk about the farmer's harvest. It's important. We, the world needs to eat, and we hear that, right? You thank a farmer, thank a farmer, thank a farmer. That's great. I'll thank a farmer. That's good. But I'll tell you what, there's even a more important harvest than food we eat, and that's God's harvest. That's souls, right? That's souls. That's seeds being planted in hearts. Those seeds being watered, right, by further witness, right? God's field of harvest is the most important thing. Souls going to heaven or hell are more important than your fruits and vegetables, more important than your pig, more important than your cow. I'm going to get a lot of farmer flack today, aren't I? Farmer's going to hate me for this. I'm just saying the obvious thing that work hard, right? And take that working hard into something that matters more than anything else, and that's serving God. Take that. Don't be lazy one place and hard work in the other. That's called hypocrisy. That's called, I know you can work. I know you can get up and get there. I know people who are faithful who have never missed a day of work, right? Hardly, they hardly even get sick. They're just there every single day. You know what that tells me? They could probably make it to church. They probably could. They could probably work hard enough to carve out the time to get there and be faithful there. It would probably be an amazing thing for them and their lives, their family, and the work that God's doing in the community. Hard work. Hard work. Look, it says in the last part of the verse, it says, Ye are God's building. God's building. You are God's building block. Think of that. You're going to leave the service knowing that I gave you a wonderful compliment that you are a brick. Right? Pastor thinks we're dumb as bricks around here. Well, I don't think you're dumb. I just mean but we're part of the building, right? We are uh, this, this guy right here. I'm a brick. All right? God's going to just put me in his building where he wants me, right? That's it. And he's going to take you to do the same thing. Where is this guy? Where is this person? Where is this girl? Uh, boy, right? Woman, man, where do they fit in my plan? What I'm doing. Let me give you some verses to prove this. Let me just read some for you. 
Romans 12 says this. Romans 12, 1, it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know this one, right? Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Say, Logan, that sermon you gave was unreasonable. There ain't no way I can be faithful in church. There ain't no way I can faithfully serve God. No way I can faithfully be reading my Bible. No way I can be faithfully witnessing to others. It is your reasonable, reasonable, right? That's like at work when, when you know, the boss says, you know, I'm going to want you to work eight to five or, you know, I'm going to want you to work eight hours a day. Some people are like, oh my goodness, they want me to work eight hours a day. That's unreasonable. No, it's actually quite reasonable. It's okay. Reasonable. The God's like, I just want you to, sh you know, show up. Be faithful in church. You know, be faithful with your kids reading the Bible. Be faithful trying to apply the principles of Scripture. Be faithful in prayer, right? Be faithful in witnessing. You're going to have conversations with people and talk about 99% of things that have nothing to do with me, but I'm the God that saved you. Faithful. Faithful. You know that verse, Romans 12, 1, it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, doesn't it? Present. You know what the word present means? It means to introduce or offer up yourself as ready and willing for service. You can present yourself. I'm here. I'm ready. This is me. God, I'm Logan, and I'm ready to serve you. Don't know how, but I'm ready. I'm willing to serve you. You know what it is that verse describes? It, it describes it as a decision, as an announcement, a declaration. Lord, I'm here, ready to serve you. It's kind of like when you ask God to save you. Like, Lord, I'm here, please save me. And he heard that prayer. Yeah. You know, a decision to serve God is not going to save you. It's a different thing, but it's still a decision. And people do need to make such a decision. Now, don't get it confused. Some people are like, well, Lord, I'm going to sign up to serve you so that I can get saved. That's not what I'm saying. But you should say, Lord, you saved me, and so I'm here to serve you. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Put me in, coach. It's a declaration. Have you ever made such a decision? It might scare some of you. Like, what if I actually prayed that? What if this morning I actually prayed, Lord, I want my life to be used for you? That's what I want. No matter what happens, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to find a way to serve you right now. Not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now. I want to find a way to serve you today. Lord, I want to find my place in that building today. You know, I want to tell you something. If you prayed that prayer this morning, God would hear it. I'll tell you what, God would even honor it. Because God, the Bible says, you ask anything according to his will, he heareth you. That, that means he, he wants you to serve him. He's going to hear it. He's going to honor it. He's going to find you a way to get involved. But are you asking that? Or is that scary? Because if I, if I serve you more, God, I won't be able to serve myself and my projects, all the important Duplo projects that I'm building on my own. You see, it's a, it's, it's a decision. That's what I mean. It's a decision in your own heart. Do I, all those things I'm working on, this, we all got lists. I got a list at home, as long as my arm of things I need to do. And I absolutely, I'm not picking on you, but I absolutely, I have enough work to do, projects to get done, that I could stay out of church the rest of my life. There's, and you're like me. There's things you could do this morning, right? I got projects on the house that need fixed, right? I got things I could be getting ahead in my secular job for, Right, health things I could work on, or just uh, books. I'm writing books. I can use this time for book. I got things you do too, but you gotta you gotta analyze. God, there's all my projects, and then there's your project. Amen. Well, God, I'm telling you this morning, I'm willing to give up some or a lot of these projects to do yours. It's a decision. You can go your whole life. It's like that man though. That Christ told us about. He was busy about his projects, wasn't he? And he did his projects so well and so often that he filled his barn full of his projects, Christ tells us, right? And then he filled that first barn full of his projects that he had to build another barn for his projects, right? And he built a second barn for his projects. And you know what God said? He, God just from heaven, he looked down at that, that guy, that hardworking guy, he's like, oh, that's what I'm talking about down there. Keep it going, build your barns, do your work. I'm proud of you. No, he didn't. The, the parable goes like this. God talked down and he said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall these things be which thou hast acquired? 
That's the story Christ tells us. Your projects mean nothing. Your projects are doing nothing for God's glory. So the decision may be hard, but think a little deeper. Think beyond what you see. The Bible tells us life is more than raiment. Life is more than what you see, right? Life is all about what you can't see. Things you can't see, think about that. What can you not see? This, uh, the book, the truths in this book, the eternal truths, you can't see all these. You can't see your children's souls, but boy, they matter more than your barn. Your neighbor's souls, souls in this valley. Some of all those kids we talk to, at, you know, when we do door knocking or we, we do uh, the fair ministry, all those souls are what matter. Amen. Oh, they matter. This life's going to pass away. This life's going to pass away. Make a decision this morning. We've got some great, great folks in the audience this morning that if you haven't already, I want you to be one that makes the decision. I know some of you in this room, you've told me you've accepted Christ as your Savior. I want to challenge you this morning to tell Christ you're ready to serve Him. The Bible says in Isaiah 6, 8, it says, Shall I send and who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. That's your, that's your wording. Give us the word and write scripture. I want you to tell God, I'm right here, use me. I'm right here, use me. You know, in John chapter 6 and verse 9, there is that lad. It says, there's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. And remember the disciples talk about, what's that among so many? Well, I'll tell you what, I want this as part of, your, part of your pitch to God today. This is like your job application. Lord, I'm here, use me. You can tell them this, Lord, I don't have much. I, I, I've, only got, you know, I've only got the two fishes and the five loaves. But what did God do with the two fishes and the five loaves? A whole lot. He fed 5,000 people. So your, your application to God this morning when you're saying, Lord, use me, you just say, hey, whatever I got, you've got it. I want to see what you will do with my life. I'm only, I'm only eight years old, Lord, but here, you can have it. I'm only 14 years old, and I've got, to, I've got to obey my parents, and my parents don't really want me to get involved, but I want to get involved. Lord, here I am, 14-year-old, use me. Lord, I'm 25, and the whole world's going crazy with the things of the world, but here, use me. Lord, I'm 95. I've got this much strength left, but Lord, use me. He'll take it, and he'll do big things. The question is, will you give it? Will you offer it? There's a verse in Joshua chapter 24. It says, 24, 15, it says, and you might see this on a wall. Maybe it's in your home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I wish for as many times that plaque had been posted on a wall, I wish that that plaque were lived in homes. As for me and my house, we will. It's the, in Joshua, they were proclaiming, yeah, here we are, Lord. Use me and use my whole house. You know who can really make this, make this claim? You know who can? Boy, I'll tell you what, a dad can make this claim. I mean, God has, God given, he put the, put the fathers of the heads of the household. So he is in the best position to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, I know some mothers, I, I love mothers who try it. Mothers try this. They, they try to make the proclamation. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But the husband is... Absent, spiritually absent, right? Just building barns or whatever, just off in Duplo land, whatever. And, and the wife wants to proclaim, as for me and my house, it will serve the Lord. I say, wives, do it, do it, do it, do it. God's gonna, God's gonna bless it. He's gonna try to make it come about. But boy, if a dad does that, you got a house that's gonna serve the Lord. But God, here it is. Take my house, take me, my wife, my children. Let us use our house Right? All the time, energy, right? talent, things that you've given our house. Lord, use it for you. Not, for, not just for us. Not for me building my legacy or for me just building bigger barns or me building my own reputation. It's, Lord, use me for you. Oh, I want dads to make that decision this morning. Oh, I want them to lead the charge. And my wife and I were making... Or we were, we were just watching these videos. She showed me this video of this study that came out. And it just ring true what we know in Scripture. But it was talking about how important the father is for children. And it's true even, even across all, all, all peoples and nations. Children do look to their fathers. They absolutely do. And it was, the study was, you know, even if the father is a, you know, whatever. And whatever terrible sins or terrible lifestyle 
the children still look to the father for leadership and direction. It doesn't matter, boy, girl, they're still looking to the dads. Ready for direction there from dad. Oh boy, there's a lot of responsibility as fathers. A lot of responsibility. In 1 Samuel 1, 28, Hannah, speaking of a mother, Hannah said, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Hannah, remember that mother who gave her son to the service of the Lord? That woman's quite an inspiration, isn't she? She said, Lord, here is my son. Use him. Well, that's a good mom. That's a good son. All the days of his life, Lord, use him. You know what I believe? I believe there's supposed to be a lot more Samuels today. But we don't have Samuels using their whole lives for the Lord. We don't have that because didn't have the mom that he's supposed to have. Didn't have the dad that he's supposed to have. Boy, parents, if you're not ready to offer up your own life, ready, right? Offer up your house. Say, Lord, here's my kid, and he's yours to serve you. We're doing our children a great disservice. I, I absolutely want to set my kids up. Say, Lord, here are my kids, Lord. I'm going to try to raise them in the Bible the best I can because they're yours. They're yours. And I want them to fulfill your calling. Right? I'm going to teach them more than just how to, how to whatever, uh, mow the lawn. Teach them more than just how to make a clean house. Teach them more how to then win friends. Lord, I'm going to teach them the scriptures because they're going to be your mouthpiece. Boy, adults, do we have any sense of this? These decisions to live for the Lord, have our children fulfill their role in God's building? We all look around our world, don't we, our nation, with some, a lot of disdain. Where did our world go wrong? It's just crazy the things you see in our world today. All these broken homes and broken communities, and boy, you've got just cities wholly gone into garbage, and states gone into garbage. And people argue about it, it seems like they've got no clue what's right or what's wrong anymore. You know where America went wrong? That right there. Christian parents not serious about serving the Lord. Christian parents not serious about raising their kids in the things of the Lord. That's where we went wrong. If you're not there, I want to tell you, you're not the answer for the world. You're the problem in the world. Let's look back at 1 Corinthians 3. Now let's, let's go to verse 1. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. It's going to talk about God's building. And frankly, I want to look at it a little bit through the lens of missing pieces in God's building. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now here you got this preacher, Paul, and he wants to tell these people over in Corinth, he wants to tell them some spiritual truth, but it's like, I can't talk to you. I can't talk to you. You're carnal. You're fleshly. It means you're thinking just through your mind. You're not doing things spiritually. You're not praying about things spiritually, thinking spiritually. Look at verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able... Paul's like, I really want to talk to you. I really want to talk to you. But you are spiritually immature. That's what he's saying. Imagine getting this letter. He's saying he wants to tell us stuff, but he's saying we can't handle the truth. That's what he's saying. Some people can't handle the truth. They're babies. They ever try to stick a steak in a baby's mouth? Don't try it. It won't work. Not ready for it. Not full grown. Not matured. Still needs the milk. Give it the milk. But there are adults... Christian adults who should be able to chew on a steak. Like, I just need the milk. Give me my bottle. I'm going to find a church where this kind of bottle feed me still. I need a milk. This is truly, I'm joking a little bit, but truly this is what the church is offering and why they're popular. Come to our church. We'll just give you some milk. Meh. <laughs> I don't know if that was a baby or a sheep. I'm not sure which one that was. Maybe it was a baby sheep. But they're still sipping milk. And they need some meat, the word of God. They need some deep truth, some deep guidance in their lives. But Paul can't. These people are still immature. 
For hitherto ye are not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Can't bear it. That's that, that's that saying, can't handle the truth. Why? Well, a big part of this is the word pride. Can't handle correction. Can't handle being told they're not perfect. They're doing something that ain't quite right. Can't handle. Don't tell me I'm not the perfect father. I'm a perfect father. No, you're not. I'm a perfect mother. We got a perfect home. No, not true. We got a perfect church. Not even true. No. We need to be able to handle instruction. Handle correction. Look at verse 3. For ye are yet... Oh, yeah, just to finish that last thought, you know, a foolish person cannot receive instruction, cannot receive correction. A wise person can receive instruction and correction. Which are you this morning? The fool? The wise man? Three says, For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Boy, Paul's wise in the Lord, isn't he? God gives him these words. He's beating him to the punch here. Because in their minds, they're already thinking, this guy's saying we, we're not grown up, we're not mature, we can't handle the truth. He's all this judgmental on us. And then he says, he calls them, um, there's, you're carnal, there's envy and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal? Walk as he starts calling them out. Because they're doing this envying thing, right? Envying is this idea of like measuring up to other people. Well, I'm better than these other people, and I'm better than those people, right? right? And I'm better than that person delivering the message, too. That's where their minds are going, this prideful thought of, we don't need to listen to Paul. We don't need to listen to anybody, right? We're ourselves. We're a shining Duplo full of magical power, building great big barns, good for nothing. Envy and strife and divisions. People who can't handle the truth, they begin to build arguments in their head, like right at the same time they're hearing truth. Have you ever been there? Well, I've been there. You're hearing something that's true, and you're supposed to receive it, but instead what you're calculating is how you are better than the person delivering the message. I'm certainly better in that way. Yep, that's another good reason. Yep, I'm better there too. That's another reason why I shouldn't listen. In strife, you're building an argument usually against the truth bearer, right? Right? Now you're opposed to the truth bearer, but what does the truth bearer do but bear truth? Your argument comes down to the truth. We are carnal people. And that's how we think. It's really true, isn't it? Instead of growing in the Lord, receiving correction, we instead we shoot the messenger. Now they become our enemy because they tell us the truth. Find some place that doesn't mention anything that steps on your toes. Those are the popular churches. That's truly, at the heart of it all, that's, that's why churches grow in our world today. They're good at dancing around your feet. They'll never step on them. Come to our church. We promise we'll never hurt your feelings. Well, I'll tell you what, God might want to hurt your feelings. You might need convicted. Please look at verse 4. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I love this passage. It's, it's, so, it's, so, it's such a guide to how we're supposed to view this world. People are infatuated with men. You know that? Men. Who's your pastor? Who taught you? Who do you follow? Who are you following on YouTube? Who do you listen to? Well, are you following Christ or not? That's what Paul's saying here. If for these people, it's all about, well, who led you to the Lord? Did Paul lead you to the Lord? Okay, well, then you're serving Paul. Well, did Paul lead you to the Lord? Then you better serve Apollos, okay? No, you follow Christ. You find ministers who are trying to get this achieved. Everybody look at me, look at me, look at me, follow me. They're, they're, they're not fulfilling the, this text. It's about Christ. It's the Lord. It's the Lord that does the work. People like being all about men because they want people to be about them too, right? Honor men, and while you're at it, honor me too. Who do you follow? Who do you listen to? I hope you're following and listening to God. 
And if you found a church that preaches God's word, good. If you found a church that just toots its own horn, that is not a good place to learn and grow. It might appeal to your flesh, though. Look at verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God does the work. Let's keep in sight what really matters, what God is building, what God is doing. Well, are you treating other men right? Are you giving other men the honor they deserve? I'll tell you what, we are all sinners saved by grace. I'm not going to spend my life praising men, and I hope you don't either. Look at verse, people who make such arguments are people who love men more than they love God. Look at 7, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth is anything. You see in this thing, the wonderful thing about God's plan for building is that the, the duplos come and they're part of something so much bigger than them. And it's not about them. But God's work is getting done and they're not getting glory because they're not they're right, sticking out here, there, pointing to themselves. And God gives this increase in the job. Look at 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. There's a picture here of work though, isn't there? Of working for God. Talking this morning about God's building, we're talking about building for God also. Think about this in the context of Paul and Apollos. Well, it's not about them, but just think about what they are doing and how you should be doing it. Planting and watering. Right? That's the word of God going out, out of their mouths, from their little duplo lives, the word of God going out. They're leading souls to the Lord. That's what it's talking about here. Planting and watering. This is part of the work. This is the laboring. This is the husbandry. This, leading souls to the Lord. Proverbs 11.30 says, He that winneth souls is wise. It talks about here rewards, spiritual rewards for laboring for God. Mark 16, 15 tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, our job, that's, that's what we're talking about. Laboring for the Lord is going to revolve around the sharing of the scriptures. Just so we're clear, right? So, so don't give me the cop-out answer and say, well, my second barn that's building bigger, you know, it's all about telling people about Jesus. No, it's not. It's just a big barn that you like because you like stuff. You like looking successful. God's work involves the Bible going forth from your life into this world, right? And God gives us a lot of ways to achieve this. This is why as you plug into your place and connect with, with the place that you're supposed to be, all of a sudden you're part of a team, right? Sometimes we, we'll do visitation here at the church and we always have to have someone stay home and watch the kids, right? And then all, all the other adults will go off and they'll knock on doors. And that's a team effort. They're all part of the Bible going forth. All right, that's the wonderful thing about church work is it takes a team. You've got someone right now, nursery, in the morning you have people teaching children. Yesterday we had people talking about, you know, the, the homeschooling programming. It's all about things that's going to help the Bible go out. That's the work we're describing today. Planning and watering. Planning and watering. Look at verse 9. Again, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Christian work is like this great Duplo Tower, right? And someone's now connecting to Paul's work, right? And someone's connecting to Apollos' work. It's building up for the glory of God. Be wary how you build, right? Right? It'll give us some instruction for that in a second. Look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay, and that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the foundation, everything in Christ for this building. 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made, made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You say, Logan, I'm, I'm living my life, and I think I'm doing some good stuff, and I'm just not sure, am I living for the Lord, or am I not? Well, I can't clearly analyze your life, but one day somebody will, and his name is God Almighty. Describes the Christian experience here one day with God as analyzing things that you've done. 
And there will be an an analysis done of was it a precious gem? Was it something of eternal worth for God? Or was it wood, hay, stubble? So today we're trying to understand better what is wood, hay, stubble? Well, I tell you what, it's your barn. It's your bank account. It's your esteem of men. It's your your reputation as a hard-working, right person. Work hard, that's great, but it's all about your reputation. It's wood, hay, stubble. Does your reputation point people to Jesus Christ? Then you've got a gem. Then you've got a gem. Maybe we hate to think about this today, but I'm encouraging you to serve the Lord, and I'm encouraging you to analyze what have you done so far. When you get before God, will you be empty-handed as far as what you produce for His glory and His honor? Look, it says in verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. This isn't talking about getting into heaven or not. This is talking about in heaven, God actually rewarding people for laboring hard. Here we're on this earth trying to labor and win man's rewards, right? Well, I got employee of the year. Oh, that's great. Well, good for you. Well, what have you done for God, right? I had a great harvest this year in my garden. Okay, but what kind of, how'd you help God's harvest? How'd you help God's harvest? Those are the things that are going to last. Your employee of the year trophy, it's going to be gone. It will melt up. Look at verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Interesting words, aren't they? It says that person's going to stand there. They brought a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble to heaven. This is everything I've done. It's going to say... They'll be saved. They're not going to get kicked out of heaven. But yet so as by fire. There's going to be a fire burning over there of everything that you did. And then it's going to go out and you're going to be standing there all alone, empty-handed. Just kind of awkwardly like, yeah, God saved me when I was seven years old and I just kind of built my own projects. I don't know what everything heaven's going to look like, but this is true. People are going to stand there empty-handed, having been given so much including the blood of the, of the Lamb of Christ, Jesus Christ, sitting right over there on the throne, right? You're going to stand there empty-handed having done nothing for the Lord. May it never be said. May we use our lives for the Lord. I want to show up. I want to show up in heaven and I want to fall on my knees and thank Christ for saving my soul. And then I want my, my, I want my life to be a picture of someone that served him. That's what I want. I'm not saying it's, it's, I'm not saying it's there, but that's what I want. You want that? Amen. How close are you to uh, attaining that goal? Or even living out that goal? It says here in verse um, 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Yeah. You're saved. You have the Holy Spirit in your life. Look at verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. That answers a lot of questions, doesn't it? People say, Logan, that church of yours, you know, we like a lot of things about it, but you're so hard on, you know, sin. It's just so hard. Well, I'll tell you what, there's good reason. Good reason. Because if a Christian, look at these words now. This is talking about Christians with the Spirit. It says in verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy Not only God doesn't use a Christian who's living in sin, right? And there's a lot of different sins out there. People choose, but I'm talking about people choosing to, I'm in this sin, I'm not getting out of it. And by the way, one of the chief ones in all of Christianity is adultery. I'm in this sin, I'm not getting out of it. It's one of the chief ones that we defy God on. But if that's you, not only is God not going to use you as a Christian, you read those words, him shall God destroy I'll just let you chew on those. I won't elaborate. But the Bible teaches us clearly that God does chastise in this world because he wants Christians to serve him, not themselves. He wants Christians to serve him, not sin. That's enough right there for every Christian to sit up tall and fear God and say, I'm not going to be going into sin and staying in sin. And that's enough for this preacher to preach against sin even though people hate me for it. But I love people enough to say, hey, don't do it. Because those words are there. You can go find another church that tells you, oh, stay in sin and you'll be fine. But they're absolute liars is what they are. 
Look down at verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. Good, isn't it? You know the people that will hear this sermon and it will go absolutely nowhere in their hearts are the people who consider themselves to be wise in this world. I've already got a lot of wisdom. Didn't really need that pep talk, Logan. I'm already good. Good to go. Let him be a fool that he may be wise. That's admitting that you don't have all the answers. God, I need your answers from your holy word. I need your help, Lord. I'm not the mother, the father I should be. I'm not the Christian I should be. I'm not the son or daughter I should be. 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Until you understand your brain to be just an uh, just embodiment of foolishness, you're not going to receive instruction. For it is written, he hath taken the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. People who think they have all the answers, God looks down and says, it's vain, it's empty, wasted. 21, therefore let no man glory in men. Did you see that? I know some people who that's all they want. They want a pat on the back. They want the respect that they deserve. They want people to treat them right, and that's all they scream and yell about. That's all they want today. You need to recognize that I'm a wonderful father or a wonderful pastor or a wonderful church member or whatever. We're therefore, therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. I want to tell you, if you ever see this pastor behind this pulpit this morning, if you ever see me up here demanding for you to glory in me, I want you to just walk out the door, because I've lost it. I've lost who deserves the glory. A lot, I've lost who deserves the honor. I've lost who saved my soul. It's not a difficult thing. We're to not let no man glory in men. We're to bring glory to God in our lives. I've got one last passage. The time is holding out okay with me, so I wasn't sure I'd get here or not. But please, let's just look at this practically in Nehemiah chapter 4, and then we will close right in Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah 4. My heart is, I love people and I want to see people serve the Lord. But I don't know how to coax people into doing that. You know that? I've met some people I've been, been talking to for years now. And even um, delivered sermon to for, for years now. But I can't make the horse drink. Right? You lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So God's got to do this work in your life, and I hope that you are at least humble, humble enough to say, Lord, I hear, I'm listening, I'm ready to serve. Nehemiah chapter 4. What's wonderful about the book of Nehemiah is the great, it's a great picture of work getting done for God's glory. Look at this and see if it relates to you and your life, or maybe you're ready for this to be you and your life. Look at Nehemiah 4 and verse 1. It says, But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we built the wall, this, if you don't know the story, it's uh, God's people returning to, the, to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. Okay? These people wanted to start, they made a decision, didn't they? We're to go back and rebuild the wall in Jerusalem that was torn down, broken down. We're going to do God's work. It was supposed to be up. So they're going to go, it says, and build the wall. He was wroth and took indignation and mocked the Jews. So what do you have when a Christian wants to do what's right? You've got some ungodly person mocking them. Absolutely. Going to happen today to the teenager, to the adult. It's going to happen, Christian friend, if you want to serve the Lord. Sadly, it might even be your own family that mocks you. Just heads up. You might want to do what's right, and your brother of all people, or your, your father, or your cousin of all people might just laugh you to scorn. Two, I want to tell you, do it anyways. Two, and he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews, they call them weak, feeble, right? People said that about um, our, what God's built here at 8th and 8th. That's just a feeble little thing. God's not going to use that. Well, I think God has. What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Something you could describe like a cult. Oh, these guys are like some sort of 
They're going to build a bunker, right? They're going to fortify themselves in Jerusalem, or they're going to sacrifice, just do crazy animal and child sacrifice. The world brings up all these crazy accusations against people that simply want to serve the Lord. Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Like you can't use those stones there to build that wall. Well, I tell you what, God can use things to build his building, build his wall. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Mocking, isn't it? Don't let mockers get you down. Don't be ashamed of what God's told you to do and what you have complied to do. Amen. For hear, O our God, for we are despised, Nehemiah is praying here, and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity and cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together under the half thereof, for the people had a what? Had a mind to work. Right? You mix, that's just that person volunteering. I have a mind to work, Lord. I'm ready to work, Lord. God's work will get done. Against all, against all odds, God's word will get done. If you bring the willingness, God will bring the power and the place and the provision. Seven, but it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah, these are the villains here, and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth. Wicked people hate this when God's work is coming together, when people are finding their place in God's building. You know that even in our church, we've had some recent professions of faith and people getting saved and getting baptized. I guarantee you the enemy hates it as they see this wall coming together for God's glory. They hate it. Eight, and conspired all of them to, together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Right now, absolutely, there's people conspiring against God's work. Try to bring down good churches and Christians who want to find their place in God's work. Nine, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. They're praying. They're being vigilant. They're being sober. Look at 10, and Judah said, the strength... Now, this is, this is one of the good guys. Judas said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that we are not able to build the wall. This is someone discouraged within. 11. And our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. They're, right? They're, they're doubting what God has provided. They're doubting whether God can protect them. 12. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. They've heard all these threats. They're going to attack you from ten different directions. This work's going to fail. And this person's been listening to the world. And they're all torn up. They're all discouraged by it. Friend, if you want to serve the Lord, you just got to plug your ears to the world. They're going to tell you, you can't serve God. You shouldn't serve God. It's stupid that you're serving God. What are you doing with those other people serving God? That's what the world's going to tell you. You're going to have to just say, shut up. Amen. If it's someone you know, just do it respectfully. <laughs> Please shut up. <laughs> Look at verse 13. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall and on the higher places, and I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Their family units here strong together, aren't they? Serving the Lord. 14. And I looked and rose up and saw that the nobles and to the rulers and the rest of the people be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. This is one of our theme verses. And fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. You see, it's possible to serve God. You say, oh, I'm too busy. I've got to take care of my family to serve God. No, bring your whole family on board. You all serve God together. God will make it work. Your family will be even closer together. You know the closest a family ever is? It's when it's serving God together. The closest you'll ever be to your spouse is when you're both serving God together. It's just true. The closest you'll ever be to a brother or sister in the Lord is when you're serving God together. I guarantee it. Serving God is a glue that holds people together. Serving yourself is this, is this combustible force that just blows things up, creates cracks. 
just asking for something to fall apart, your family, your relationship. And it came, 16, it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the harbingers, and, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall, and they that bear burdens with those that laden, that laded every one of, every one with one of his hands wrought in the work, and the other hand held a weapon. Multitasking, isn't it? I'm not, gonna, I'm not going down some sort of path of uh, militia or something. I'm, I'm saying it's possible both to do God's work and provide for your family, right? I can't serve God. My family will be in danger, right? Our finances will be in danger. This will fall apart and that will fall apart. No, it's quite possible to multitask, right? You to be the dad you're supposed to be, but still the Christian you're supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It says in verse 18, For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, and so builded. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said to the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, The work is great and large, and we are separated upon the wall, one from another. In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, ye re resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. There's work getting done here. God's work is going forward. But all these people needed to have a livelihood. All these people needed to take care of their families. We understand in the story of Nehemiah that if you put God's work first, all these things shall be added unto you. So in your decision this morning, in your decision to serve the Lord, if part of your thinking is, I can't do this because actually my stuff, I gotta do it. You're telling me I, I, can't, I shouldn't be feeding my family? I want to tell you, put God first and all these things will be added unto you. You will not lose if you decide to serve God with your life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless the preaching, Lord, this morning. All the scriptures we read. Lord, if there's someone who hasn't accepted Christ as their Savior, Lord, and is trusting fully in Christ, I pray they do that. Their salvation and no other but Jesus Christ. I pray that help them realize that their works can't save them, it's just the blood of Christ. And then, Lord, I pray that you would be with the person who is saved. I pray that they would find their place in your building. They would pre present themselves a living sacrifice. They'd present themselves, Lord, a brick that's ready to be placed where you choose and to be faithful to that placing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.